Welcome to the Elizabeth Cunningham Show, Courageously Expanding Love with me, Elizabeth Cunningham. Has the way that love has arisen in you seemed out of place or even taboo? My mission is to expand the conversation of love in the world. Is it possible to have deep, loving, healthy relationships? Have you ever been curious about having more than one relationship or partner at a time? Get ready to transform in love. Be courageous and set yourself free. In this show, we talk about relationships, sex, love, and the ways we wish we could be, but never thought were possible. I shed light on things that are not always talked about with conversations about expanding love. The Elizabeth Cunningham Show starts now. All right, welcome to the Elizabeth Cunningham Show. Uh, I am Elizabeth Cunningham, and today we are courageously expanding in love um, with Yael Rosenstock Gonzalez. And uh, we are, just as a reminder, we are live every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Pacific time. And so that is the time that we have right now. Um, And we're gonna go ahead and get started. I am so, so, so excited to have you on the show. Thank you so much for saying yes. I appreciate you being here. And before I before I even let you speak, I'm just going to go through your intro here really quick. So Yael is a pleasure activist, which is a term popularized by Adrian Marie Brown. Um, Yael in- centers identity and social positioning work values self-exploration and promotes intentional practice as a vehicle for desired shifts. Through her company, Sex Positive You, Yael supports clients in finding pleasurable, joyful, and positive experiences with self and sex. Uh, Yael is a sex identity, relationship, and intimacy coach educator, researcher, curriculum writer, and the author of a an intro guide to a sex positive you, lessons, tales, and tips. Oh my goodness. Um, she's also the founder of Kaleidoscope Vibrations LLC, a company dedicated to creating space for individuals to explore and find com- community in their identities, including those outside the scope of sexuality. Whoa. Thank you for so being here. To have that read out loud. I know. It's like, wow, I'm I'm a really impressive human. Wow. <laughs> Which you are. <laughs> By the way, thank you so much for all of the work that you do. It speaks so closely to my heart. And so I'm so happy to have you on the show to be speaking today. So thank you. Thank you for having me come on. <sighs> okay, so the title of our show this day, evening, whatever time it happens to be, um, is Identities of a Multidimensional Human, and speaking specifically about um, sex, sexuality, and pleasure. And so uh, I'm just so interested, like, there's just so much here, there's so much depth to talk about, but I guess what I wanted to ask you first is what inspired this? What inspired, you know, sex coaching, you know, as a, as your form of work and, and to specifically have sex coaching be centered in identity formation and narrative integration, interrogation, excuse me. (laughs) So I think sex was kind of written in the stars. A friend of mine did my star chart a few years back and sex education and social justice pop up across the board. Um, My planet is Venus. My name is Yael, which is a biblical character who had sex with a general and then killed him, but used sex to exhaust him. So everywhere across the board, sex is just meant to happen. I don't necessarily, I have things that brought me there and life experiences, but I've always been on this path. For identity, though, I grew up in New York City in a home with three native languages, uh, two religions. My mother is a Puerto Rican Catholic. My father is a Jewish man. 
Uh, and I grew up just not really knowing where I belonged mm -hmm. and whether or not I counted. And so, you know, with my mom, I was like, well, she counts because her native language is Spanish. So she's Latina. And all of my friends growing up were uh, Latinas of color. And so I was convinced, well, because I'm white, I can't be Latina too. Those things can't coexist. And if they do, I don't, I'm not a real Latina. Mm -hmm. And then when I was, you know, Jewish, I'd have people tell me, well, you got it, you're Catholic because your mother's Catholic. And then being queer, I didn't know how to express that. I wasn't sure like if I counted because I had had so many experiences with cis men. And so there was just so much of my brain space being taken up by this idea of not being enough mm -hmm. and not belonging. And with the Latinidad in particular, I had, you know, the little curvy shape. I started getting hit on when I was 10 years old on the street. I'd turn around and men would be like, whoa, she's a baby. <laughs> but I had the stereotypical Puerto Rican uh, physique and I held on to that. And that became such a big part of my identity that my sexuality, my sensuality and my body connection to validate myself uh, ended up really informing how I understood my experiences of sex. And so all of these life experiences, in addition to being invited to be a peer health educator at 15 years old for reproductive rights and uh, experiencing trauma, what have you, just led me on this path to want to A, support others and not taking up so much brain space and thinking they don't count or they don't belong, and B, understanding the ways that their identities do inform their experiences of sex, whether they're experiencing racism or fetishization or not feeling like what they're doing is valid because of something else, trying to help folks just find peace in being and not trying to complete someone else's definition. And I think that that is so important because, I mean, not everyone has as many, you know, intersectionalities in their identity as, as you do. Um, but I do find that a lot of people do, you know, a lot of people do have a lot of different intersectionalities in who they are and that that shows up differently and how you get to move throughout the world. Or as you were saying, you know, how people told you that you should move throughout, well, you should be this way, or you can't be this way, or well, if you're this, then you can't be this, or, mm -hmm. you know, and how the outside world and the expectations of others, you know, mold who you think that you're supposed to be, when, you know, it sounds like, you know, you've discovered for yourself, and now you're helping other people really define who they are and not hold on to those outside factors as much, but mm -hmm. like really defining who you are and then being empowered by who you are and like how your intersectionality is like beautiful and like expressive. 100% that you can choose to take on or not labels that exist, but it's about finding somewhere that you feel connected to and spaces that you feel connected to and experiences that you feel connected to as opposed to being restricted. Because like, as you said, even people with single cultural or racial or ethnic identities, I've had plenty of those people come to me and say, I'm still not enough. Right, I, I don't feel like I'm uh, immigrant enough because I came young, or I don't feel like I'm X race enough because I don't fulfill blank stereotypes, even though this is their one cultural identity. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my gosh, yes. Um, and okay, so I uh, so it it's really interesting how uh, you know obviously we all have a experience of this in some way. Like you said, even if we only have a single identity or or not you know not very many um, that we might identify with, but how do you? How do you come to this, you know, with all of these, you know, different narratives um, culturally or just in your environment, how do you, you know, discover who you feel or who you authentically are? Like, what's the process that you use to really help people with that? So I have a signature process that I call uh, You Are Enough Love, interrogating your narrative. And it was actually when I was creating my business, someone suggested it because it spells out Yael. And I didn't want my business to be spelled out as Yael, but I thought I'll, I'm going to keep this for something else. <laughs> I love that. Oh my God. I didn't even notice that when I was no one does. Up. <laughs> A little That's sneakiness. So sneaky. <laughs> but anyway, I, I use this process probably with at least 90% of my clients 
and I do this workshop more than any other um, across groups and spaces because it uh, gives people space to interrogate the negative narratives that they are holding. And so it's not always identity-based, but so much can be. And so whether it's saying, I don't feel like I deserve pleasure, right? Or I'm not sure if a more concrete example that I think is very relatable, like I take too long to orgasm, mm -hmm. right? And so what's the story behind that? That A, you don't deserve pleasure. You don't deserve the time that it takes to hold that. But there might also be religious constructs, right? Maybe there is something there that is making you feel guilty for engaging in sexual acts, whether it's solo or with someone else that is, that is holding back. And so then we have to interrogate, why is it that you take long? Is it just like physically it takes a long time for arousal? Are there things going on that are distracting you? Is there guilt? Is there a sense of lack of deservingness? And so I have them identify narratives, but first I just have them think about an overall theme and kind of track where did, how was that theme influenced throughout your life? And who were the people influencing those messages? And then we see how that interacts with other pieces. I always invite my clients to tell me the identities that they want to share. And you'll have some people who'll be like, this is my age or that's my gender. And there are others who it's a paragraph of identities. And that indicates to me too, how salient are these things on your mind? And so this process allows us to, uh, it's a multi-level process that I'm happy to explain later if you'd like, yeah. but it gives this opportunity to start um, kind of decoding and figuring out what is it that might be uh, sticking mm -hmm. that is harming you that feels true and feels like meh that we can pull apart and see if there's something there that uh, would be more beneficial to your well-being. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, sorry. I, I'm going to, I'm going to keep being like, oh my gosh, da, 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 da. like every single time that you stop talking because like this, I, I mean, identity is, you know, we, we carry these around all the time. And like you said, even if it's only one, or maybe if, you know, if it's multiple, you know, these are things that we carry around every single day that they influence our, it's not just in like sex and sexuality where it's like, we really do like, it colors our entire world and how we're able to operate and who we talk to. And, you know, and so I, it, it's such important work that you're doing and this is, okay, I'm going to stop geeking out about how awesome your work is, but, um, uh, but I think that, you know, in really taking the time to have people notice those things, I think that's a really beautiful start to have people be aware of what are the identities. And I think, you know, the other thing too, is that as people are following along in this show, like start to think about, you know, what are the things that you really identify with? It's just like, this is me, like, I'm a queer person, or I am, this is my religion, or this is my race, or gender, or whatever it is, like, for a really long time in my life, I was like, I'm a woman, and I love being a woman, like, that was, like, number one on my, like, identity chart, <laughs> um, and so for all of our listeners out there, really notice, like, what are the things that you really solidly identify with, um, that are a part of your identity. And then, yeah, once we come back from break, I would love to go a little bit deeper into the process if you're willing to share that. Sure. Okay, beautiful. All right, well, we're gonna go on a little break here. So start to think about what are the things that you really identify with in yourself? What are those identity identity markers for you? And then when we come back, Yael is going to go even deeper and farther into this process. All right, beautiful. We'll see you in a little bit. All right, welcome back to the Elizabeth Cunningham Show. We are still here with the amazing Yael Rosenstock Gonzalez. And we're going a little bit deeper into the process that she uses to help. And I might characterize this in the wrong way as I summarize it. So please correct me if I am misleading. Um, but as you deconstruct people's identities and like how, how that um, impacts how their sex life is or how, or how they see themselves as sexual human beings. So on the break, I asked people to 
you know, really identify, <laughs> identify what your identity is um, and what those identity markers that you really hold onto so that you can move through this process as she talks through it. Yeah, and like a reminder, we all have a gazillion identities, right? So whether or not you, everyone has a gender identity, even if that gender identity is a gender and everyone has a racial identity based upon the social cultural, con, social cultural constructs of the place that you live, even if you don't identify with it, which is an issue when people travel, right? They get racialized in new ways. Mm -hmm. And so it's not that we don't have identities, but often people with mainstream or normative identities might not see themselves as gendered or racialized or what have you, because it's on the top of their mind. So with this process, I, there's two different pieces I can go first. It depends on the group or the client. If I already from, and this often happens, they, they start telling me their story, right? We do an initial um, session and I can hear the stories that they're telling themselves. I can hear that there are sticking points that are uh, harmful to their well being, whether it's sexual or not. And so I will then suggest that statement and say, does this feel like a thing for you? Does this feel like it's true for you? Let's break that down. If it's more of a general thing where they're saying like, I have an issue, I will then instead have them think about, like I said before, potentially timelining. So I, the, this piece of the workshop, I have uh, inspiration from Dr. Bianca Loriano and Sonali Rashatwar, they did a fat SAR that was incredible and they had a like river activity for timelining your experiences. And then Dr. Oh, Dr. Kimberly Martin from TN Therapy, she had another workshop where she wrote people's timelines down by age and developmental pieces. And so I give people four different options. Those two are two of them, but four different options for thinking about like, what are the influences? Who told you to believe these things? Was it media? Was it people in your life? Was it you making assumptions based upon feeling out of place, even if no one said something explicitly to you, but the world was saying things to you? And it helps people map out not just negative memories, but also positive, neutral, and think about what was most impactful and what led things to feel more concrete than they might be. <clears throat> Excuse me. And with those statements, part of the inspiration in general came from when I was in therapy and it wasn't a good match for me, but one of the activities we did was, is the thing that's hurting you true? Can you 100% say that the thing that is bothering you, that you believe to be true is true? And so with my Latina example, it's definitely not true, right? I am Latina, but, <laughs> but if it were a less concrete example, like can I 100% say that this is not true for me, that I take too long to orgasm or that I'm not attractive or that I, smell bad or that I don't count as queer, whatever your uh, issue there is. And because that piece was less uh, less important to me, because I already know that the, the thing is not true, I instead bring people through a different process where we identify where it's coming from so that we understand how loaded it is and if there's cultural or religious uh, context to it. And then we identify three forms of evidence that counteract it. And so the Latina example, right? My, my WhatsApp group of all my Puerto Rican family members. Um, the, this doesn't make me Latina, but my love of salsa and my uh, rhythmic self and the way that those things feed my soul. And so you just start saying, okay, how, what is evidence that contradicts the statement that is harming me? Okay. And eventually, depending upon whether or not someone is ready at that point, we start to rewrite it. And we might rewrite it in an affirmation. I am blank enough. I count as blank. I am enough. You know, whatever the, I deserve pleasure. If that's not where they are, we'll do if formations. So if I were enough, it would feel like this. I would treat oh, myself this that. way. Yeah, totally. And I, I'm sorry, I don't remember who created information. So I can't cite them. I apologize. <laughs> I should look that up. <laughs> But we, it's basically like an opportunity to hold. And so it's a, the process overall takes around 40 minutes generally, but it walks people through really excavating what's happening. Because it's easy to just say, okay, I'm going to give some evidence. But if we don't think about why it's in your brain to begin with, why is this so deep seated? Why is it, if it, if it weren't deep, it wouldn't be hurting you. Right. And you probably wouldn't think of it as a, 
undeniable truth. And so it's important to me that we excavate that uh, carefully and with like consistent care. And then I have them continue that process and practice it and test it in different spaces. And it becomes a tool that they then use if their clients, um, if it's a workshop, then that's a choice as to whether or not they do it. But with clients, we continue to pull out narratives and they get better at being able to replicate this so that it helps them rewrite those things. Yeah, and then you start to hear the stories that you're speaking, right? You start to be like, oh, I, that's actually, is that true? Like you actually start to hear it yourself. You know, you mentioned that when you listen to clients um, at the beginning, like you can hear it, but then when you practice it, then like the, the client or whoever's practicing it, you know, can also start to hear it as well, which makes it, it's such a great tool. Um, so what are some of the, um, just to kind of, uh, make it a little bit more um, concrete because like I love like the concept of that and like the um, overall like flow of that so what's something that you see maybe as a theme that people deal with like are there things that you see on a regular basis that generally people deal with there are pockets but honestly everyone comes with such different things so mo uh, one of my recent clients, we used it to think through polyamory, mono monogamy, and non-monogamy mm -hmm. and saying like, I am monogamous or like, this is the way to be. And so asking, okay, let's excavate. Where did you learn that monogamy is better or more right and the way to live? And who taught you that? And is that actually the experience you've always had? Do you think that that is true for you, that you are monogamous or were you taught that you were monogamous? Um, and either option was possible. In this case, it wasn't so much a negative narrative as a stuck narrative. Mm. And in another case, uh, someone feeling like they can't, they can't be alone, right? And so excavating that, like, what does being alone mean? Is it a fear of abandonment? Is it a fear of getting sick and not being able to take action around it? Is it a fear of loneliness emotionally? And so what are the things around it that make the idea of being alone so frightening? And then also flipping it and saying, what have you done when you've been alone? What is evidence that you in fact can do it when it's necessary? And also there's nothing wrong. So it's a whole circle of thing. There's nothing wrong with not wanting to not be alone. We're social creatures. And so you get to be with people. You deserve to be with people. And so it was taking this narrative, figuring out, what's leading to it and also validating that you don't necessarily need to change every narrative or flip it. It's more about uh, being kind with yourself and your interpretation of it. Does that make it more? Yeah, no, ab absolutely. Cause I think that, you know, everybody can, uh, even though we all have, you know, dissimilar uh, lives, like we all have our own particular um, uh, identities, right? Um, and intersectionalities and like the way in which we are unique, you know, we also have very similar experiences. Like when you said like, I'm not enough, right? Mm -hmm. And I like, I absolutely identify um, with that with like, I dealt with that for a while in like the queer space. I was like, oh, I'm not queer enough. Like, I don't, I don't look queer enough. I don't act queer enough, whatever that means. Um, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, there's, there's just like a not enoughness about it. And I think that, that um, the not enoughness bit of it is really like a theme for yes. you know, people in general, right? Um, so yeah, and I think that like making it a little bit more like concrete because then people can really hear like, you know, where do you see where you have these stories about yourself or your identity? And I love that you brought up too that it's not necessarily a negative thing. Mm -hmm. Like it could just be like a stuck thing or just something that isn't true, you know? Um, uh, yeah, I think that that's really beautiful. So what are some of the results that you see people get out of doing this work? For the stuck versions, it can be just kind of like an epiphany, like, oh, you're right. These things aren't true. I have an opportunity to see the world in a different way. And that opens up the doors for just better understanding and deeper uh, self-reflection. For the enough work, so that I'm not clear enough, I'm not trans enough, I'm not black enough, I'm not Latin enough, right? I hear all of those. <laughs> um, it becomes a self-acceptance. 
right, recognizing that there is no specific uh, pedestal or checkbox or check mark that you have to fulfill and trying to supporting folks and finding spaces where they are being supported in that and validated. So perhaps you don't feel queer enough. And when you're, if you're right, uh, polysexual, so you like more than one gender, there might be gay spaces and lesbian spaces that aren't validating and therefore don't deserve your presence because they won't help you feel validated. But that means that you get to go to polysexual spaces and feel validated and find the people who are like, yeah, of course you count. We are community together. And so the effects are helping them, uh, people finding community, finding validation, their identities and creating a broader uh, worldview. Ah, oh, I love that. Oh, beautiful. And that's that's a perfect place to to pause for our next break. Um, and when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit deeper about, you know, how has this process been used to support clients and really what, what does this look like kind of on the other side, you know, coming out of it and how do you, um, integrate these practices as well. So perfect. We will be right back, um, from our break. All right, welcome back to the Elizabeth Cunningham Show, Courageously Expanding in Love, and we are talking to Yael Rosenstock Gonzalez um, about identities of a multidimensional human. Um, specifically, we've been talking about um, sexuality and uh, sex and pleasure, but we're going to get a little bit deeper into that. And we've been talking about multiple different like realms of identity and why it's so important, but that is my next question. You know, why is this? We've, we've talked about the what of this, like, what is this? What are we even talking about? You know, and, uh, but why is this so important? Why is this so important to talk about? It's important because identity, again, whether or not you're accepting or rejecting or even sit like aware of it is built into so much of our world, at least within US culture, there is a strong, strong effect of in-group, out-group, and the real, the real material um, effects of structural oppression. And so with, when people are being convinced, particularly multiply marginalized people, those with disabilities, those who are queer trans, people of color, particularly black and indigenous, that these folks are being told consistently, you don't count, you're not enough, you need to do more in order to be recognized, um, you're not, ex you should not expect to be treated well. You should not expect to be cared for. You should not be expect to have ease or pleasure or joy. Those messages go deep, right? In the same way that we talk about affirmations, we do affirmations because people spend all day self-criticizing. And it's the opposite, right? You're, you're telling yourself all the ways that you don't count, that you're not good enough, that you could do better. What if you just concentrated more? And so if your mind's doing that constantly, and then you have the added piece that society's doing it to you constantly as well, it, it corrodes your self-esteem, it corrodes your well-being and your ability to connect with others in a way that is empowering for you. It takes it, it creates power dynamics that are dangerous. And so this kind of work helps people, it won't even the playing field as so far as oppression and marginalization is concerned, but it helps regain power so you recognize that no just because the world keeps telling you these things does not mean you you should act and live in a way that says i'm going to take it that interpersonally you have more control to do what is right for you uh, particularly within relationships that you are choosing to engage in yeah well kind of broadening it out too do you believe that starting with this work on an individual level can then expand out to, you know, social structures, to economic structures, to, you know, broader structures in our society? Yeah, I mean, so cultural and social change, uh, when I teach, so I teach about this as well, and I do workshops on, organiz on organizing, it requires all hands on deck. And so you've got the like helpers, the advocates, you have the rebels, you have the what have you, but it also requires different levels. And so the personal, the intra-psychic, the interpersonal, the community, and then the cultural social. And so I do think that when we're shifting ourselves, we have to always be shifting ourselves in order for the rest to occur. 
we can't change society if we're not working on ourselves. And we all have internalized uh, white supremacy. We have internalized racism. We've internalized ableism. There's all these things that we're holding. And so if we're not questioning those things, if we're not pushing back, then we cannot possibly create a world that is doing that. I completely agree with you. And I think that, you know, not only is the work that you do so important because it does impact on such an individual level and like how you're able to live your life and see yourself and like be empowered in who you are and write your own narrative. But I think that the why, the why of this is also because it does have that ripple effect um, all the way, all the way out as well. Yeah, it's, that's beautiful. Um, so what do you, what do you see? So that's, you know, that's, that's why, that's why to do this work, you know, not only on an individual level in your own life and happiness and fulfillment, um, but also as a broader concept as well. Um, but what, what do you see as far as, you know, how has this process been used to support your clients? You know, we kind of started talking about like the results that people get, but like, what do you see actually happens when people take on this work, you know, when, when people go through your process? So most of the time I'd say that folks, I mean, I've never had anyone say they didn't enjoy it and wasn't useful, but they tend to forget about it. It doesn't, it's not like actively on their mind. And yet I can, I can see the way that it is actively working. And so, you know, when you're a coach and I imagine a therapist and you tell someone, try this thing and they're trying it on for the first time and it's a chore, right? Because you're doing something new. And so it requires attention and intention. And at first it's, it's difficult. And then all of a sudden you stop thinking about it because you've gotten into the practice. You get muscle memory or brain memory of it and it becomes natural. And I find that this activity is similar to that. I will have folks tell me, oh, you're right, I should try that, but it sounds hard. And I'll be like, well, remember when you said that when we did that thing? And now can you name, let's just sit down and name the ways that you've done all these things that were hard that now are second nature to you. Let's reflect on where you started in this process and where you are now. And so it's beautiful, even if they don't realize why, <laughs> it's beautiful to see that they're using those tools, that method, that personal excavation process to push back. And to say, okay, I'm not even going to let this statement or story sink in, right? Before it gets deeper into me, I'm already disentangling it and pushing it out because I know that I should be because I've been practicing to do that. Oh, that's so cool. Well, because, you know, and that we talked about that a little bit earlier where it's like, you know, first you don't hear the narrative as you're even speaking it. And then you hear it as you speak it. And then that's really brilliant as well, where it's like, it's even before you speak it, it's like when you hear it from other people, it's like, oh, I'm actually not even gonna, oh, that's so cool. It's like, I'm not even gonna actually take that narrative on. I hear the narrative and I'm not gonna take it on. That's not me. Say no, thank you and you give it back. <laughs> no, thank you and give it back. Yes, exactly. <laughs> And I do have someone who reached out to me, which made me so happy, like months after a workshop. So not a client. And this person was very self-aware because I guess, because we weren't working together. So they had a one session in a group and they did it and they were able to reflect. And they said that they got out of a bad relationship as a result of the workshop. And they felt like they had opened themselves, their mind, their heart to what they really wanted for themselves in the future, that they were no longer going to be settling for the crap that people had expected them to settle for. And so it was helping them find acceptance and love for themselves, which allowed them to then create the spaces that they wanted to be in. Wow. And that, and isn't that the goal? You know, yeah. I, like, isn't that, actually, yeah. <laughs> for those who just are, who are listening on podcasts, yeah, Elle did the, did the heart oh. sign. <laughs> Oh, yeah, but it's so happy. yeah it's like I feel like you know as, as we move throughout the world like that's what I hear over and over again from people is that like you know I just want to be myself like I just want to express myself I just want to you know have my feelings be validated and who I am be validated and you know, I think the other thing that's so important about this work that you're doing is that you have that almost self-validation mm -hmm. as well. 
and that you don't, and there's people that it's like, okay, you don't feel the same way I do, but that's okay. I don't need to be validated by you or like I, be, and also like, and I have this community of people that I've found, yes. right? I have this yes. community of people that I found and like, we feel the same way. And so I feel validated by my community as well. That's a theme. The idea that folks are wrong to need, and I'm one of those people who works for that theme wrong to need outside validation, right? The idea that like we should be independent and like not need anyone. And it's wrong that my self-esteem gets influenced by the beliefs of others. And we excavate that too. And we're like, well, words can hurt. And we are again, social, cultural, uh, we're social creatures. And so our interactions do have a very high impact on us. And also we get to choose who we allow, like whose energy is allowed in our space, like whose words are allowed to exist around us. Um, well, to an extent, right? Not everyone has that privilege to, to choose that much, but yeah, it's all of those things. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's also, I think that that happens over time too, because as you shift and change, then I believe that you start to find, you know, other people who are also um, like-minded, right? Yes. But I, but that's as you start to discover that for yourself, and then you know, and then you either search those people out or they find you. So, and I think that's also important to mention too that it doesn't happen overnight. You know, it's no. not like you do one exercise for forty minutes and now all of a sudden you have like this amazing community of people. It's like <laughs> it that's, does, yeah, it does take time. You know. That's one of the values at the beginning, if I do it as a workshop, that do not expect completeness, do not expect uh, transformation in this like hour, 40 minute, 40 minute space. Like these are tools that you will need to practice and implement. Things do not happen, as you said, overnight. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. But it's important to start to do the work. What's the, the uh, quote is the best time to plant a tree is uh, 20 years ago and right now. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> I like that. So how do you see this? Um, of course, I want to talk about sex and pleasure, um, but we're going to, oh, and we're going to go on a break um, here really quick. But so that'll be our little cliffhanger. Um, so <laughs> when we get back from the break, I am going to ask you about like how you see, um, I can only imagine that inside of sex and pleasure that it just gets deeper and better. Um, but we're going to talk about that a little bit. And then we're going to um, do some of our closing questions. And then I'm going to have you talk about all the things that you're doing so that obviously, since people have been falling in love with you over the show, that they can find you. Um, all right. So all of that when we get back. Welcome back to the Elizabeth Cunningham Show, Courageously Expanding in Love. And we have absolutely been courageous today with Yael in talking about identities, intersectionalities, and how that impacts who you get to be in the world, in your relationships, and your relationship. Uh, we've been talking a lot about our relationship to ourselves, which I think is really beautiful. Um, and I kind of wanted to turn the attention in this last segment to sex and sexuality. And so how do you see this, um, you know, when you're for lack of a better word, like healing, healing these parts of you that have been stuck um, or negatively impacted by, you know, narratives and stories. How do you see that when people are healing from this, how that impacts, you know, sex and pleasure and like their own sexuality? So sometimes it's really direct and um, because I don't mind, I'm going to use myself as an example. Brilliant. <laughs> uh, one of my narratives is the taking too long to orgasm and feeling like, oh no, like this is a, a burden or what have you. And being able to, to sit there and be and say, I have no problem uh, showing love, affection, sexual attention to my partners, right? I, my partners affirm that they want to be supporting me and reaching my sexual uh, heights. And if someone gets tired, I have sexual, I have sex toys and those can augment the experience. And just like being able to tell myself, okay, all of these things are true and how long I take doesn't really matter unless I have like a plane to catch or something and to, to be able to relax about it. And it also means that if I know 
that this is bothering me, if I know this is getting in the way, because often for lots of folks that I do know, if they feel this way, right, that that orgasm takes too long, then they get into their head and they're like, oh, I'm taking too long. I, I like, and try and squeeze out an orgasm. And that like doesn't really work. From experience, I can say it either makes them crappy or it just like doesn't happen. And so then you get to think about, okay, if I know that's going to happen, what are the things that I can do to, to stop it? I can ask for the affirmations I need from a partner. I can check in. I can set a, a ground rule that if they get tired, that they will pull out a sex toy. So I don't have to worry about their well-being because they're going to take care of their well-being. And I just have to worry about my pleasure. And so it really gives you the opportunity to, to relax a little bit mm -hmm. and not be so much in your mind. And when it comes to things that are further from sexuality that are harder to identify as potential um, thorns in your sex life, it could just be your general mental well-being. If you're concerned that you're not queer enough and you're going out with someone of the same gender, then feeling more confident in that there are different ways that queerness looks will help you relax in all of your interactions with people of the same gender, not just your sexual ones, but it will help you relax in the sexual ones to say, everyone starts somewhere with their sexual experiences. Everyone is learning new things. Every body is physically different and the experiences we have are different. And so it, it kind of releases, because shame is debilitating, it releases some of the things that can be clouding our ability to be present. And presence is really useful for having a, a highly pleasurable sexual experience. Oh, yes. Brilliant. Absolutely. I'm just like, ah, hundred percent fireworks all over the place. Yes. And, and also that it sounds like in, you know, doing this work and having that reassurance for yourself and giving yourself, you know, this compassion that it really does lead to um, more options. Like, like you said, there's not like a stuckness anymore. There's almost like this creativity. Like that's what I heard yes. in what you just said. There's like this creativity because it's like, oh, well, what about this? And like, there's new possibilities and like, oh, I'd never thought of that before. And like, oh, and it leaves room for curiosity. Like, I wonder how it's gonna be with this person. You know, mm -hmm. I wonder how my body's gonna respond. I wonder how their body's gonna respond. Like, it sounds so much more playful. Yes, as opposed to having strict goals. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. Okay, so as, as we're kind of coming to a close in our show here, I have my closing questions for you. So what, tell me what love means to you. Ooh. Oh, boy. To me, love is like a, there's different types of love and they feel different. Kind of, uh, I don't know if people have seen Don Juan de Marco, but there's a quotation about love being a consistent and warm flame that doesn't burn or explode. It just like consistently there and creates this glow that is steady versus this fire that engulfs you and takes you whole. Um, and I think that there's just like a lot of different ways that love manifests, but that it's care and wanting the best for those you love, including yourself, and wanting those people, yourself included, to experience joy and contentment and pleasure and connection. Whew. Thank you. If you could have someone take just one golden nugget away from this show today, what would it be? You are enough. You are already complete. You don't need to make changes to who you are to be worthy of the things that you deserve and you deserve all sorts of lovely things. Um, and if you're stuck with that, then you deserve to get support in that or to read things that will help you feel better and more connected and more worthy. Mm. Yes. Yes. To the yes, 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 yes. I know people on the podcast can't, can't see me like just raise my hands. Um, <laughs> and then if there is one action that people could take, what would that be? Start to play around. And so the, the way that I help people identify their narratives is what makes your heart clench? 
or makes you feel sad, ashamed, anxious, um, that just it, it's standing in the way of feeling good and start to knock it out. Uh, really just like whatever it is that gives you that like screw feeling, mm -hmm. assume that that thing can shift and play with it and see what it looks like to shift it. If this were true, what would happen? If that were true, what would happen? What kind of thing can I think about that pushes that idea into a different space? Well, I could not agree more with you. Okay, now that everyone is in love with you, how can they find you? What are you up to? I can be found on social media, uh, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook-ish, Twitter, as Yael the Sex Geek, Y-A-E-L the Sex Geek. My website is sexpositiveyou.com, so U-Y-O-U. And it is not ready yet. I do have a book, An Intro Guide to a Sex Positive View, which talks about a lot of different things, but not this method. I am currently working on a workbook, though, that will help folks work through this method on their own because some folks don't like to talk to people or don't have the financial um, capacity to, to have one-on-one -on -one sessions or what have you. So I definitely, you know, I will, I will work on that and we'll get that out for y'all who want to try this process. And then I actually, starting this or next week, will be on the app Actio, offering what will for now be free sessions to everyone who joins. Um, the app is in like beta, and so they are making it free to everyone. And so if you want to engage with me personally, that is a great space to do it. All right, beautiful, brilliant. Anything else that you want to share as far as anything that you're offering or promoting right now? I'm just super excited to have a little bit more free time to start <laughs> seeing clients again. So definitely hit me up if you're wanting some one-on-ones. Um, I'm excited to have this now group coaching offer, but uh, keep me in your mind because I will start working on creating more accessible group options so that more folks can see that kind of stuff. But if you want connections to freebies and letters, I do have a newsletter and you can sign up on my website for that. Okay, great. And I have all of your, um, your links and your social media and your links and all of that in the show notes. Um, so for people who are watching this in the future, those people who are watching live, um, uh, I hope that you wrote all of that down. Um, and it should be in the show notes right now, actually, uh, if I am remembering correctly. Anyway, it's in the show notes. And so that way people can find you very, very easily. Um, thank you everyone for listening today. Uh, I hope that you just drunk all of that in. Um, thank you, Yael, for being on the show today. I so appreciate your, your presence, your wisdom, your knowledge, your expertise, your enthusiasm, and all of the passion that you pour into the work that you do because it's so important. Thank you. Right back at you, Elizabeth. That was a really great description of <laughs> all this going on. I love your enthusiasm and your passion and your care. Oh, oh, thank you. All right. Love Fest. Love Fest on the Elizabeth Cunningham Show. All right. Thank you so much to everyone. And until next time, and next time is Tuesdays at 3 p.m. Pacific time. <laughs> but until next time, keep loving. You have been listening to The Elizabeth Cunningham Show, courageously expanding love with me, Elizabeth Cunningham. Tune in live every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on TransformationTalkRadio.com, where we shed light on relationships, sex, love, and the ways we wish we could be, but never thought were possible. Learn to love yourself and create the relationships you want. Connect with me at elizabethannecunningham.com. That's elizabethannecunningham.com.